Well, good afternoon. I hope you've learned a lot today in all of the sessions and networking, and we hope that this session will prove very valuable for you as well. I also want to thank you. It is 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I'm sure you'd rather be in your rooms taking a quick cat nap. So I have a sugar hit for all of you. Uh, there's candy, there's popcorn, uh, Vicki is, is handing out some of the stuff. Now, on Saturday, I left it in the car when I was doing my errands, and it melted and then re-hardened. So if it's a little funky looking, don't worry. It's good candy, so enjoy. Okay, so uh, the name of the uh, panel is More Disruptive Technologies You Must Know About. Are they competition? Are they opportunity? We have an amazing panel. I'm Robin Warner. I'm not the amazing part of the panel. I'm the moderator. I'm Robin Warner, Managing Director at De Silva and Phillips Investment Bank. We have Kristen Frodella, who is the, managing, is the Head of Global Education Marketing at Google. We have Jessica Lindell. She's the executive director of Glass Lab. We have Ben Lowinger. He's the EVP of Copia Interactive. And we have Tammy Mank Wincup, chief operating officer of EverFi. So there was a shopkeeper, and he was dismayed one day to see that there was a competitor that opened up next door. And above the competitor's store, it said, best deals. He was incredibly upset. And then all of a sudden, he sees another competitor opens up on the other side of him. And to his dismay, an even bigger sign says, lowest prices. He's now in a panic. He's beside himself. He said, this is it. Uh, my career's over. Might as well set up shop. But then he thought about it for a while, and he came up with an incredible creative idea. And on the top of his store, he put the biggest sign of them all, and it said, main entrance. <laughs> so the point of this little ditty is that um, disruptors and competition do not have to be a bad thing. It can make you very creative. It can represent partnerships. Today, we have four impressive companies who are responding to what the market is screaming out that it needs new technologies, new business models, and in one case, a whole new normal, because they are listening to what the market is asking for. Each of the panelists will speak for five to seven minutes. I'm going to be the ogre that will <coughs> give them a little cough, I told them, when they have one minute left. I don't have a gong, unfortunately. And we're going to find out what makes them disruptive, what you should know about them, and then think about are they a competitor, or could they actually be a helpful partner? Okay. The first person is Tammy Mank Wincup of Everfee. She's the chief operating officer. Everfi uh, teaches, I'm sorry, Everfi teaches critical skills. Her investors are phenomenal. She's got Jeff Bezos, Amazon founder, Evan Williams, Twitter founder, Eric Schmidt, Google chairman. She's previously run a $300 million innovation fund for international education and economic growth opportunities. And she was also a consultant and invest investment banker, mostly overseas. She said her second rodeo was running an ed tech company, having been way too early in the game in the late 90s in San Francisco. Tammy? Can you hear me? Is this good? Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, I, too, appreciate you being here at uh, late in the, in the afternoon um, to hear what, what I think you know, are some pretty innovative stories from other panelists. And so I'd love to share a little bit about what we're trying to pull off at EverFi and, and how we look both at the K-12 and, and higher ed market. And so you know, just as a, a little bit of background for those of you who are not familiar with us, uh, EverFi is an education technology company. We, were, we, we started six years ago with this concept that there were all of these really critically important real life skills that had not found their way into the classrooms of Americans' um, K-12 system or higher ed at scale. 
And these were the skill sets that employers were demanding. These were the skill sets that were being required of, of, our graduate, of our graduates when they left high school, when they went into college and beyond. And, and so that was the first premise, that there were these skill sets that were being left out. The second was that technology was finally at a point where you could actually harness it in a way that could help teachers who are typically being asked to teach these skills as one more things in their portfolio to really diversify delivery. And I know Jessica is going to go into detail about some of the same commonalities that we have in a viewpoint of how to use great digital learning, um, great adaptive pathing, great assessment on the back end. Um, and so that was the second premise. The first was a whole host of critical skills that tended to get the short end of the stick. The second was that technology was finally at a point where you could see adoption in a way that didn't require as much as it did before and that you could build it very much as we had done in the, pri you know, in the private sector and non-education sector. And the third um, was that the skill sets that we were working on, that we really wanted to work on, were ones that tended to be unfunded mandates. They tended to be where state legislators said, hey, everyone should learn financial literacy, but no additional dollars were given to the K-12 system to fund. That everyone should learn about alcohol awareness or sexual assault prevention in college, but there were no extra dollars necessarily given to figure that out. Um, and so we built out um, a third-party payer system that allows us to then reach students at scale. And I think that this is the second story of where EverFi um, has, has really had some traction. And I think that it's, it's one of the things that, that we kind of giggle about in the ed tech sector right now is that whenever you read everyone's press releases, including ours or people in the rooms, you know, they're, everyone's supposedly reaching the same, you know, one million kids. And I think that we have a very different definition of what it means to reach those students. Um, and it's particular because the skill sets that we work on are skill sets where it's not enough just to count a login. It's not enough just to know that a student got there or that a teacher started to use. So what we count is getting all the way through. What we count is what we measure on formative assessment as well as attitude and behavior change. And so it's been really heartwarming and, and great, both for our, for our partners to, to be able to look six years later and say that within K-12 and higher ed, uh, we've reached seven million students that have gotten all the way through our platforms. And, and that, you know, when you begin to look at some of the statistics around MOOCs or other things like that, where um, you know, where you have 5% completion rates or 10% completion rates, it means the ability to really use the technology in a way that's sticky, in a way that navigates exactly to the student voice and what they want. Um, and then the third piece is our model, which is if our goal is to really be, is to really broaden the education sector. We felt that it wasn't enough to just look at what the K-12 system was saying to each other, but we began talking to funders and sponsors. And what I have listed here are just a few of the folks that in the last six months, we've, uh, you know, we've partnered with to bring these skills to thousands and thousands of school districts across, um, across the country. So uh, this summer, Pharrell Williams uh, brought us all across Virginia to their summer camps and schools that he has been a part of in K-12 in Virginia. We announced uh, just last week a, a national partnership with the National Hockey League that is bringing our STEM career platform to 30 different markets across North America and Canada. Uh, and, um, and Mr. Bezos and Jeff, who you, who you know is an investor who has built a, a pretty uh, great network, um, a commerce network, and, and the ability to kind of look at that from an education point of view. And then in higher ed, uh, last week, uh, we were a part of the, uh, the new White House campaign called It's On Us which is to really promote and to look at sexual assault on college campuses and how to prevent that and how to make education a piece of that. And it's the largest provider on higher ed campuses of online sexual assault prevention and awareness. Um, we were a part of that. And I think that, you know, that name dropping is not as much about name dropping, it's much more about how we make 
the education industry bigger than the, frankly, the folks in this room? How do we get partnerships that broaden the capital that's in there, that broaden, broaden the desire for what skills we should be teaching? I think that part of um, what, how we look at disrupting the education sector is to say, perhaps we've been looking too internal for all of the answers, and how do we not just pay lip service to public-private partnerships, but how do we actually operate them at scale? Um, the last, I think, is goes back to you know, the topic that Robin talked about, which is really the technology. And right or wrong, but never in doubt, we certainly have an opinion that we believe that the ability to deliver content is king, the, the ability to make that assess that makes that interactive, that makes that not just consuming content, but allows really great diversification of delivery. That is foremost, I think, what is leading in higher ed in K-12. We see a lot of what we would call kind of feature companies, uh, you know, that are playing like little roles that are really important, but we think for those organizations to really uh, be, be a part of something greater, those, those features will become commodities and they'll have to be plugged into a larger platform. Um, and then the, the last is going to how to build technology and what our 70 you know, engineers and curriculum designers across the country do for us, which is that we think that real blended learning or digital learning is not just taking what happens in a brick and mortar setting and putting it online. We actually think it's hard and it's messy and it requires a lot of um, real interactivity and adaptive pathing and that doesn't treat everyone equally. Um, and so that's what we're shooting for when we take on a new, a new skill set. And perfect timing, thank you. Uh, we are going to leave time at the end for questions from the audience. So as we go through the presentations, jot down any questions you will have and we'll leave time for that. I am going to ask one question, though. How the did you get Jeff Bezos and, and you know, <laughs> Evan and Eric, how did you get them as investors? Um, well, uh, they were a part of our Series B, with a lot of luck, but a lot of perseverance. Um, you know, we had in our Series A a really great team of investors. We had the largest venture capital firm, New Enterprise Associates, in our first round, and Allen and & Company. And I think that we went specifically not to education partners initially. We wanted to prove that you could use a model that works outside of the education industry in the education industry. So the first is, I think, our Series A um, investors gave us credibility that we didn't, you know, we weren't just talking to the education industry. Um, and I think that um, those individuals looked at us and said, we actually understand what you're trying to build. You're not trying to build something small. You're not trying to build something niche. And clearly, the three of them have a, a very good track record of building huge networks. Um, and so they've taken a, a great bet, and hopefully they're pleased. Well, very impressive. OK, uh, the next person we have is Jessica Lindell from Glass Lab. She's the executive director. And Glass Lab focuses on transforming learning and assessment through digital games, which, as you know, has all of a sudden become extremely popular versus 10 years ago when teachers were saying, no way will we have gaming in the classroom. She's had 15 years experience leading teams that design, develop, market, and sell learning games to companies such as Scientific Learning, Riverdeep, HMH, and The Learning Company. She's also on the board, very admirably, of Education for Change, which is a charter management organization uh, in Oakland for California's uh, disadvantaged youth. Thank you. I was given permission to use the clicker just as long as I don't press one button, but I wasn't told what that one button does. <laughs> so if you guys start falling asleep, I'm going to press that button. Um, just kidding. So um, I wanted to start off um, by just centering everybody on, on the challenge that we're focusing on, which is um, preparing kids for 21st century success. This is not new to anybody in this room, um, but there, there's a particular data point up there that was very new to me in my career. 
um, which is the data point on the U.S. being dead last in problem solving for millennials. And that, to me, was one of the most startling data points that really motivated my excitement around the concept of Glass, Glass Lab. At the end of the day, for me, it's not about games. It's about games as the medium for what they can achieve. And really, when you think about games at their essence, they're a series of very interesting problems. And oftentimes, you do them collaboratively. And if you guys think about your day and what you do every day in and out, it's solving problems. And more often than not, it's solving them together. And so really feeling like games were an opportunity for us to embrace 21st century success and prepare our kids for the 21st century success skills that they just weren't receiving right now in traditional education. Oh, wrong way. Um, so a few other data points on this. As you guys can see, lots of kids ages 2 through 17 are playing games. But in our specific focus, which is middle school, it's almost 100%. I think it's 99% of kids are playing games. And even more um, exciting, I won't use frightening, I'll use the word exciting, is how much these kids are playing games right now in their personal time. So when we talk about disruptive technologies, they may actually say that a textbook is a disruptive technology for them because they are spending boys 24 hours a week playing games and girls, or 23, and girls 12 hours a week playing games versus about five to six hours a week of doing their homework. And so what our focus was is how do we get to where the kids are and where they're already learning and how do we actually make that learning transparent and visible? And that's when it comes to teachers. So as you guys have heard, there has been an enormous increase in the amount of teachers using games in the classroom. And from our ongoing conversations and research, it was for two very specific reasons. The first was they really felt like they had to be the entertainer. It was almost like that old Billy Joel song that they were standing at the front of their classroom constantly trying to entertain their kids to keep their attention and they were losing the opportunity to have that art of teaching. And they feel like digital games really give them the opportunity to provide their teaching in a way that's both engaging and meaningful. So again, yet another powerful tool in their toolkit to really engage their kids. The second data point is I think it was within the last couple of months that women who oftentimes are in the target age group of teachers have become the highest demographic of game players in the world, surpassing teenage boys. So we are now realizing that teachers are actually strong gamers themselves and they're seeing the transformation that they're experiencing through gaming. But I think most importantly for us is that games have a significant learning impact. This is just one example of lots of research that's been coming out done by the Stanford Research Institute and looking at a meta-analysis on all of the research done on both games and simulations and saying that kids who use games in their instructional experience had a 12% increase in learning versus kids who didn't use the games in that same instructional experience. And then finally, this is really where Glass Lab's competency is and where our focus is, is around the data and analytics that you can get from gameplay. We don't believe in the chocolate-covered broccoli model that you get to play a game as a reward for your learning experience, but rather that the gameplay is your learning experience. So all of the choices and actions and decisions that you're making within that game are what's informing the assessment model so that it feels like it's a very continuous experience for the player, and then the teacher can get that data in real time and learn how their kids are doing. So Glass Lab has been around for about two years. We were co-founded by some very diverse partners um, that you see up there, both from the education space and from the game space. As a nonprofit, we're supported by the Gates and MacArthur Foundation. And what we've learned in the last two years is that this opportunity is, is never going to make a dent if it's just us creating our own games. But rather, we needed to open up our platform and our analytics engine to power third-party games. So we've just launched this year the opportunity to use our assessment and analytics engine with your games or your apps so that we can also pull data from those games aligned to critical standards, both Common Core, 21st century, and state standards to be able to show how kids are progressing within the game. So the beta has launched. It's called Playfully. It's featuring our first third-party uh, partnership with Filament Games and iCivics on the game Argument Wars. And there'll be about 10 games on that platform by the end of the year. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> I won't press the button. You guys all did a great job. <laughs> so again, uh, we're going to move on, but I want to ask you a question. And I'll click back. 
So you had some amazing uh, launch partners, and how did you get all of these groups together to launch your company? So I think all of them had very, very different needs um, in looking at the opportunity for Glass Lab. So um, from the Pearson and ETS relationships, it was really focusing on how do we innovate in this world of assessment um, and learning. And, and the partnerships are actually with the research divisions in both of those organizations, phenomenal researchers who are really at the cutting edge of assessment. Um, for EA and then Zynga, who has come on board um, in addition to that, it was constantly seeing this opportunity on the side of their business models for really making an impact in the learning space, but not necessarily seeing that minimum benchmark of an initial $50 million return in the first year, being able to match their business model. So they felt like it was a, it was a great opportunity for them to start learning from the space and enter into the space without sacrificing the opportunity cost of what their core business was focusing on. And just one more quick question. Did you put the groups together or did they hire you after this entity was put together? So the groups were actually all put together before the entity was created. Mm -hmm. um, and, a and much of that is attributed to the strength of the MacArthur Foundation and the Gates Foundation in bringing those groups together. And if any of you guys know the MacArthur and Gates Foundation, they couldn't be more different. Um, so we do have very diverse um, partners and goals in their approaches. OK, thank you very much. Okay, the next is Ben Lowinger. He's the founder and executive vice president of Copia Interactive. And what Ben's company has created is a bit of a new normal, and he will, he will explain that to you. Um, he has 15 years of global operations experience across very business sectors from electronics to creative and media. He has a proven track record of forging strategic partnerships and successfully scaling innovative ventures, which this certainly is. Ben? I'd, uh, I'd first like to thank Robin and the uh, conference organizers for including me on this panel. My, uh, my mother would actually say that this is a very appropriate panel because I've been disrupting the classroom since the first grade. <laughs> <laughs> Disruption, um, and uh, you know, when, when you look at a market like, like uh, the ed tech market, it's a little bit of a difficult concept for me personally to grasp because when we look at the student population that we serve and all of the opportunities that we enter into, these students are living in the 21st century outside the classroom, engaging with all of that technology and you know, outside the classroom. And <clears throat> what we really look to do uh, in many cases for all sorts of irresponsible purposes. And uh, what we look to do as we approach all of the opportunities is to harness the, the knowledge and the skills that they have, bringing those technologies into the classroom, fostering that uh, collaboration and that communication that um, they're so incessantly connected to, and um, making that the cornerstone of you know, again, where it should be, and that is their education. In, um, <clears throat> I think, the best uh, example, or encapsulated example of, of what we've uh, accomplished is uh, in the K-12 market in Australia, where we, um, I believe one of the uh, comments on, on the first slide was a uh, question to whether uh, it's competition or opportunity. Uh, in the Australian K-12 market, we've actually partnered with um, all of the, uh, or entered into a partnership and a consortium with all of the major publishers who um, represent about 85% uh, of the uh, approved nationally adopted content. And we've created a single solution, a uh, single per student uh, subscription fee, where students gain access to all of the content that they need throughout the course of, um, throughout the, course of the semester. Again, all inside of this seamless Copia environment and interactive experience, putting, um, connecting students and their teachers and students and their peers inside and around the content, and extending that opportunity um, to all content providers who have content that are aligned to the standards in the marketplace, where teachers can then do what they've done for years, and that is follow a particular provider's uh, curricula all the way through or, as are the cases we're seeing, leverage the search and discovery tools that, uh, that Copia provides, again, aligned to the standards. And they're selecting learning objects, 
sometimes from Pearson, sometimes from uh, Wiley, sometimes from uh, Oxford or Cambridge or a third party supplementary provider. Um, video content, HTML content, chapter based content. Um, and with uh, Copia's uh, assessment tools, again, which allow them to create the alignment that's necessary and the real-time communication, that private communication that students have with their teachers and the uh, group functionality inside of the platform that allow teachers to truly differentiate and provide um, variety of materials to the you know, variety of students in, inside of you know, any given classroom. We're taking the technology and the experiences that we, we've never had a situation where we've had to train students. Um, and I think that that's probably the most telling thing. And when you can allow them to tap into those skills and use them for responsible purposes, and the same skills that they, the market will expect from, the job market will expect from them, um, it's actually a pretty rewarding uh, experience. So um, a few questions for you. Uh, first of all, could you tell them how you came about building this platform, why you build the platform before you even did one thing? What, what did you do? <laughs> Leading question. Trial and error. Um, we looked at the marketplace and tried both from the parents' perspective, from the this, you know, state level perspective, the district perspective, tried to understand, we had this idea for this, you know, aggregated solution, this combined solution. The, mar uh, the one thing that, uh, you know, we hear from just about everybody in the market that we talk to is um, that they're looking for a seamless way to, you know, manage curriculum, manage the, the, um, the interaction in the classroom, allow teachers or administrators the freedom to select the materials that they think are most appropriate while at the same time working with publishers and celebrating their content and not trying to you know stuff it all into a, a you know a box and um, uh, you know there's there's no you know change in the marketplace you know it's best happens when the market it, itself is you know drives that change and uh, for Copia that's really um, you know our first big break came in Australia in the K-12 market from the demand in the marketplace. We've since taken that um, here um, to the U.S. where we've, um, uh, we're working with the, uh, with the Commonwealth of Virginia on a um, statewide platform that again includes content from uh, as many or all of the supporting proof content uh, providers working with them to align instruction in the uh, you know align instruction in the classroom with the standards and with the assessments um, funny enough I, one of the biggest complaints we hear of, you know all over is that instruction in the classroom is not aligned with the way students were tested at the end of the year and not coming from an educational background you know some of these things kind of sound like you know you'd, you'd be surprised or you'd think that they were pretty easy to, to solve but again the only way to do that is to work with each district, each state that we do, and um, do so by providing a variation of the technology, the platform that we've developed, tweaked to their needs, and um, whatever current variation of standards they might be calling it. And was this the first digital platform that Virginia has adopted on a statewide adoption? I believe so. Okay, interesting. Could you also share with them what you're doing in higher ed? Sure. You're a good coach, Robert. Um, <laughs> in higher ed, um, again, in Australia, we've partnered with um, uh, Co-op, which is um, the college bookstore operator on uh, 24 of uh, the larger uh, campuses in market. Um, last I looked, they uh, controlled over, a, uh, over 50 percent of the sale of physical textbooks. And again, it's uh, working on a university by university basis to uh, provide students with an interactive environment, connecting faculty and students inside, or inside and around the content that, um, in support of the syllabus. And um, again, partnering locally with publishers to make sure that um, all of the um, HTML content, the video content, the chapter-based content is all um, 
available in uh, you know in uh, in the way that um, that is necessary. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Last but not least is Kristen Frodella from Google Education. She is the head of global education marketing. She and her team have created dozens of large and small scale programs, including Google Teacher Academy and Google Science Fair. I've been following the great press coverage that you've gotten on the Google Science Fair, which just completed. Um, a couple of years ago, I had to leave all the stuff in that Kristen sent me because I think it shows a personality. A couple of years ago, Kristen realized there was more to life than technology, so she temporarily fled to Bali where she became a certified yoga instructor. She practices her yoga training every day and applies the mindfulness she won in the rice paddies of Ubud, and I, I went online to hear the pronunciation of that, <laughs> while navigating the concrete jungle of New York. She, quote from her husband, also bakes a damn fine strawberry rhubarb pie. <laughs> which I would have thought she would have brought here, but that's okay. <laughs> if it was August, I would, I would be able to May. Okay, Kristen. Thank you so much, Robin, and thanks to all of you guys who have hung in there. I know it's, what, like 4.40 now, so everybody's probably really starting to, to lag, so I really appreciate everybody's attention, and thanks to my fellow panelists. We're all doing really great things in education, finance, and gaming, and opening up space to make teachers the disruptor, um, which we think is really important. So, so disruptive education, um, I think that's probably the base tenet of what we think of at Google as disruptive education is that you know, we provide the technology, we wanna provide the technology and then get out of the way so that folks in the education space who are the education experts can make the decisions so they can be the disruptors in the education space. The teachers can be the disruptors in the education space. The kids can be the disruptors in the education space because they already are and they will continue to be. And we think that they should have the choice and the ability to make the choice to do that kind of stuff. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about what we do um, at Google in education. Well, first, um, you know, I guess I'll say Google is not really an education company. Um, you know, our, our mission is to um, make the world's information, organize the world's information and make it universally accessible. Um, but really, um, Google's base was born in the education space. Um, Google was actually created, for those of you who don't know, um, at Stanford um, in, uh, uh, in a Stanford program um, by Larry and Sergey um, as their final project, and they, it was actually called uh, Backrub at the time. Um, and they left and, and they opened Google, so it was really built out of the education space, and so we really believe in education and want to be able to support um, educators and students all over the world. Um, we started our first foray in the education space in 2006 when we um, launched the Google Teacher Academy. We went all over the United States and we talked to teachers about what they needed in education and they said, I don't know, can you guys teach us how to search and teach our kids how to search? And we said, okay, cool, what about all the other stuff? And they said, you know, what other stuff? And we were like, mm, it's not so good. So, um, so we launched a teacher academy um, where we invite teachers who are really wired, who are working in technology and working in innovation um, to come learn from each other and learn about technology skills and innovation in the classroom and share that with one another. There are currently about 14, 1,500 um, Google certified teachers all over the world who really kind of help us bring our message out about innovation in technology um, in the education space. Um, also in 2006, we launched Google Apps for Education. Um, our first school who was working on it was Arizona State University. Um, we focused on the higher ed space until about 2009 when we developed some tools that were good for K-12. Now we have about 30 million active users um, who use the product regularly on Google Apps for Education. Um, and in 2011, we introduced um, Chromebooks for education. So Chromebooks are a very simple uh, laptop 
um, and they have very little on them. They have a Chrome browser on them, and you can also add different apps on them. And, and uh, to quote um, an educator that we deal with, you know, Chromebooks are just so darn faceless. And that's what the education folks like about them, is that there's not a lot to compete with the educator and to compete with what the educators are doing in class. So if the educators want to get a game app, they can, they can get a game app. If they want to just use Google Apps for Education to really help promote collaboration, communication, 21st century critical thinking skills, they can do that. They can do what they want with them and manage them easily. Um, in 2013, we introduced tablets with Google Play for Education. So Google Play for Education is our content store. And it includes content from tons of content providers, including some of the, you know, the big three providers, as well as content from um, smaller applications, videos. Um, and we're also helping to promote uh, user-generated content for teachers to use as they will in the classroom. Um, in 2014, sorry, in 2014, we also launched um, Google Play for Education on Chromebooks so that teachers can use them on Chromebooks because um, Chromebooks just picked up this, this great uh, meteoric popularity this last year, again, because they're so faceless and they can do with what, what teachers want. Um, and then the most exciting thing I think that we launched this past year is a product called Classroom, which allows teachers to um, reach out to their kids and uh, give them assignments using Google Apps for Education and collect assignments, grade assignments. It's just a really good way for them to collaborate, work with their kids. Um, yeah, and so that's kind of what we're doing in the education space. Also, we work on some uh, education programs because we really want to empower kids to be the disruptors. So some of them are, they're all in the STEAM space, so science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. So Doodle for Google allows kids to develop their creative side. Cultural Institute um, allows kids to have access to museums all over the world. Maker Camp allows kids to really you know, get dirty and get in and make things themselves and, and learn by, by failing, learn by iterating. Um, Made with Code is a program that um, we are hoping will help kids, especially girls, to learn how to code because there are very, very few girls who are coding right now, um, who are graduating with computer science degrees, and that's a big issue for us. Um, and then lastly, um, as Robin mentioned, the Google Science Fair, which, which invites kids to come and change the world through scientific exploration by doing science projects. And we just wrapped our uh, 2014 Google Science Fair this past year. Uh, this past week, rather, um, with the winners being three girls from Ireland um, who worked on a project to increase crop yield and help fight world hunger. So really exciting to get to meet these young kids who are really striving to and believe that they can make a change so early in their lives. They can create world change so early in their lives. So those are some of the things that we're doing in uh, at Google to support education, to support teachers and students to be those disruptors, to be the change themselves. Oh, thank you. You know, I may be showing my ignorance, but when I got this slide from Kristen, I was actually surprised at how much Google is doing in the classroom. And it's, it's extremely impressive. Um, of all these things, and I know some of them are very new, were there any that, that just appeal to the teachers immediately? Yes, and has classroom. Been, oh classroom. my gosh. Um, so when we launched classroom, we did a soft launch of classroom um, in early May, early to mid-May. Um, and we basically said, hey, if you guys are interested in signing up early, let us know. And we got, I think, something like 64,000 signups within the first week. It was crazy. Um, and then um, we launched our full version of Google Classroom in August, and the number of signups, the, the amount of popularity that it's seen is unprecedented. It's 
you know, it's a free tool and teachers are saying, wow, I can use this with Google Apps and I can just seamlessly reach my kids and, and it sort of works as a very lightweight, I don't even want to use the word LMS, but it works as a really lightweight way for us to work with our kids and that's been really, we developed it or our product managers and our engineers developed it working with teachers throughout this past year. So we knew what the teachers wanted, they told us what they wanted and we listened um, and have been iterating on it ever since. Wow. And of all of these, obviously not Chromebooks, but is this all free to the teachers and students? Um, yes. Uh, so all of it's free. Google Play for Education is free. Some of the content in Google for Education, uh, Play for Education is free. And then some of it is pay content. And it's, you know, it's content that comes from providers. So. Right. Yeah, very impressive. Okay, thank you so much. So we'd like to open up, uh, if I can click this ahead. Okay, we'd like to open it up for questions. I think now's when you need to hand out the candy, Robin. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, we've got some. It is National Coffee Day, you know. Uh -huh. I know, I'm sorry. Or I in Seattle, we that. call that Monday. <laughs> <laughs> Frank Catalano with Intrinsic Strategy, based in Seattle. Um, curious about, I mean, we have four very different stories. Uh, and I, by the way, I give Copia the prize for the best use of an overused buzzword with disrupting the classroom since first grade. Um, <laughs> True story. What, what keeps you individually each awake at nights about who could displace you? And I don't mean you and your particular job. <laughs> well, that could be too. Right. I, think it's, I think it's making sure we're figuring out how to, how to give our kids what they need. You know, one of the things last week during the science fair, we have these judges who come to us from all over the world. They're like these amazing, incredible science judges, scientists. And what they say um, about the American kids is interesting. And we had 18 kids last week, nine boys and nine girls from nine countries. A number of them were American. And what they said was, American kids are always the most confident and maybe the most overconfident. And like the PISA tests show that. Um, I was surprised to hear what, um, what you said, Jessica, about the uh, critical thinking skills problem and solving. problem solving <laughs> yeah. skills yeah. Um, that, that American kids are lowest in problem solving. I actually did not know that stat, but that's probably the thing that keeps me up most at night. What's the best way to get these kids critically thinking and ready for the workplace? I think in terms of, um, you know, what, what keeps us up at night is, is we feel this huge sense of urgency mm -hmm. to what is happening right now um, in ed tech, but also in just education and, and media and mobile. And I think what keeps us us is, is we iterate very, very fast. We, you know, we use agile method to a, like, to the extreme. And so I think that part of what, um, we think about is, you know, are our partners moving as fast and can we scale and implement as fast as, you know, as what we're doing? Because we certainly do not believe that the frothy state for which, you know, education technology is in right now is going to last forever. Um, and, I, and I think that when you're working within an industry that typically has not worked as fast, um, how you push that ahead and how you move that appropriately um, is, is a piece that, that certainly makes us, um, you know, keeps us up in terms of, you know, thinking about what students need and when people come in, you know, and, and say, well, we'll just try it with one school or one set of students or stuff like that. We look at a set of skills that we think that there are thousands of students graduating or not graduating without. And so we, we leave the conversation very impatient. Um, in, in terms of that. 
I think for us right now, um, and it changes every few months, as you guys know, um, for us right now, it's the challenge we have is we've got a small team of 20 people that have really diverse skill sets. So we've got data scientists, game designers, uh, research scientists, learning designers, product managers. And our biggest challenge is all these people are super smart. But what we need is a focus on usability and ease of use. Um, so in my experience, there's three criteria that make products in this space skyrocket. It's engagement, effectiveness, and ease of use. And I think we've got the first two down. But that third one on how do we give that data to a teacher and they can get it in 10 seconds or less and take an action on it is really what, what our focus is and what our challenge is. And we look to Fitbit and and other kind of data devices as learning for us, but that's really what we're trying to, to crack the nut on. I think that um, from, from our perspective, it's the focus on the market. There's a lot of noise in the market today. And um, as, as a company, staying focused on what we believe um, will make us successful, what we see uh, that our customers want, and at the same time, focusing on the best of the noise and being able to um, drown out and walk away from you know, a lot of the very interesting noise, but one that we know ultimately will take us off our path. Okay, thank you. Yes? Ben, can you talk a little bit about how your coalition of publishers came together? I mean, were they there or did you help form it? And then any differences between doing that in Australia and now trying to do that in the States? That's, uh, that's actually a great question. In, um, in Australia, it was the publishers who got together responding to pressures that they were feeling in the marketplace, um, realizing that if somebody wasn't, you know, somebody was going to do it and, and, and meet the, the, um, the you know, the, I guess the, the requirements of the marketplace, and um, they felt it better be them. Um, in, in other markets, it, we're in the U.S., in the K-12 market, it, our successes have been driven more by the market based on a state level and district level. Um, in the higher ed marketplace in the U.S., we're working very closely with publishers to deliver solutions and content to students on campuses based on their needs. So um, it really depends on the, the, uh, the vertical in the market and uh, the particulars of any given market, but we're seeing uh, you know, a healthy mix. Could you also just men well, do you mind if I mention that in Australia, the teacher can actually um, pick by the chapter. The publishers are comfortable with that, correct, Ben? Yes. We have um, the search and discovery and uh, the metadata provides the opportunity for teachers to um, create their lesson plans with learning objects at a chapter level and uh, along with all the support materials that, that, that might come with that particular chapter. Um, here in the U.S., um, you know, we're not quite there yet. Um, so again, market uh, realization of what the market uh, needs are and, um, you know, the particulars. Okay. Well, first of all, again, thank you all. We know it's late in the day. We hope you found this informative and interesting. And I can't thank Vicki for giving me such a fabulous panel to work with. They were very easy for me. So thank you very much, and we appreciate your time.